Okay, this is chapter five, section two, the railroads. This is the second part of the industrialization uh, flip video unit that we're doing. And the railroad is going to completely transform uh, the ways that people are gonna move about the country, not only for, for people to travel from place to place, but also to move goods and products uh, crisscrossing uh, anywhere across the country. So you know, if you think back 150 years ago to the time of the Civil War, um, you know, the road, roadways uh, were, were horse and carriage, and uh, you had steamships, but the, the best way to travel, the quickest way to travel, was by the railroad. So during the Civil War in 1862, we're going to see the big railroad boom, and this is where the Transcontinental Railroad uh, got underway. So the idea of connecting the railroad from the Pacific Ocean all the way to the back east to the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so the Pacific Railway Act was passed, and that's going to allow for this, this huge boom in, in the railroad industry. So two different corporations uh, started construction of the railway. One of them started on the West Coast, and the other one started in the Midwest. And this new railroad would allow for goods to be shipped quickly, completely across the country. So the Union Pacific uh, started in the East, in Nebraska, and began building the tracks westward. So their task was difficult because Native American land, uh, they were infringing upon that and they had to face attacks from Native Americans. Also the uh, frigid, frigid, uh, freezing winters and the scorching uh, summers. So those conditions were, were not easy. And over 10,000 men worked for the Union Pacific. They lived in camps along the newly constructed tracks and they would push west and move their, their belongings with them. Um, but there were labor, money, and engineering problems that plagued the company. And some days um, they weren't able to work at all because they lacked uh, the supplies necessary for construction. The Central Pacific Railroad uh, started in California and they're gonna work their way east. And uh, that was a really difficult endeavor uh, because they had to blast through mountains. Uh, Leland Stanford was in charge of the operation, and uh, he's famously known for Stanford University. And because they didn't have enough workers in California, um, they hired about 10,000 uh, Chinamen and paid them a dollar a day. Um, but this was rough, dangerous work, blasting through, through um, mountains with dynamite. Um, thousands of people died in the construction of this railroad, and they too had to face Native American attacks as well. Um, they're going to meet in Promontory Point, Utah, and that's where the last spike was driven in, and they used a, a golden spike. Uh, each mile of track required 400 rails, and each rail needed 10 spikes to be nailed into it. And in total, there were 1,774 miles of track, which is about uh, a little more than half the size of the United States. And seven, over 17,000 spikes drilled into the ground. So here is the celebration of uh, Promontory Point in, in Utah, so a tremendous achievement in the second half of the 1800s, 1869. Um, so this track is going to lead to others, and soon the country will be littered with railroads crisscrossing the nation. So goods and resources can be moved from west to east, from north to south, any way, any time. And smaller, unconnected railroads um, we're, we're starting to become connected to the major tracks, which will allow for people to move quickly across the country. And because of the railroads, uh, time zones were incorporated. Uh, the old school way of telling time, whenever it was noon, the sun was at its peak in the sky, that's when you set your clock to 12. But since the sun rises and sets in, in different parts of the day throughout the country, um, you know, nobody could really keep keep good time. And that was a major problem with the trains now moving across the country. Um, two trains could be on the same track, it could lead, lead to, a, to a collision and death. So the major train companies are gonna create the time zones uh, that we know of today. So here in Connecticut, we live in the Eastern time zone. So if it's three o'clock in Connecticut, we're one hour ahead of the central time zone, which stretches here from Ohio all the way to Nebraska. And then you have the mountain time zone, which, which goes from here all the way to here in Utah. 
and then you have your Pacific time zone, which is three hours behind the east. So if it's three o'clock here, it's two o'clock in the central time zone, one o'clock in the mountain time zone, and then 12 o'clock noon in, in California. And then Alaska and Hawaii, which are not states, not even close yet, they're gonna be four and five hours behind uh, the east coast. So you can see here the Transcontinental Railroad um, made its way all the way across the country um, and then connecting with other railroads people can virtually go anywhere in the country and through any state or any territory the king of the railroad industry was Cornelius Vanderbilt he's got some sweet mutton chops uh, he was the most successful of the railroad owners and one of the richest men in the country and he controlled most of the railroads from Chicago in the center of the country all the way east to New York City and he was very good at making offers to smaller railroad companies and buying them up so that he can establish a monopoly um, so people that controlled um, almost an entire industry um, some people gave them the name robber barons because they could set the rates as high as they want and people really could do nothing but pay their rates or not uh, use their services um, we're also going to see a lot of corruption in this time. Um, railroad companies are going to swindle investors and also taxpayers. They're going to bribe officials. They're going to manipulate stocks uh, in order to make profits. They're going to cheat on their contracts and debts. Um, Jay Gould was a notorious corrupt, notoriously corrupt railroad owner. And even members of Congress and the Vice President of the United States were involved in scandals involving the railroads. Uh, the very famous Credit Mobilier scandal in 1872, uh, members of Congress uh, sold their shares of the stock at, at a discount. Um, they were sold shares of the stock at a discount. And in exchange, the railroad received more grants, so everybody was, was getting rich. And uh, of course, when the, all of this went down, uh, nobody was in, was in trouble. No files were charged at all. Um, so the government really couldn't do much to stop these robber barons. Um, especially since many government officials were, were uh, collected off of these guys as well. So we'll get into um, bringing these guys down when we get to our next unit, which is the Progressive Era. Um, and also the government enacted a laissez-faire policy so that the government stayed out of the business's way in order for them to make maximum profits. So that's going to bring us to an end of the railroad section. And the next video you guys will see will be about big business. So homework, write a one paragraph summary of what you just learned.